When you are saving money, should you be making money? Today, we look at the differences between traditional, stroke conventional, and Islamic banking. What's allowed? What is not? So how does one system differ from the other? Here's an example. What is the difference when a conventional bank lends you $100,000 for a house and makes $25,000 in interest? An Islamic bank says that's wrong, but could still end up the same $25,000 better off and you still get the house. We're going to try to explain. A system of finance that has built much of the Islamic world, running parallel to its neoliberal Western counterpart with its roots in religious doctrine. Islamic finance is said to be a more moral, stable approach to the business of money. But is it really so different from the alternatives? The popularity of Islamic finance is on the rise around the world. Many people are enticed by the notion that its practices are more ethical and responsible. Financial agreements are issued in accordance with Sharia law, in a way that introduces shared risk between the investor and the borrower without the collection of riba, or interest. And loans cannot finance businesses dealing in alcohol, pornography, or pork products. While these ideas may seem incompatible with much of Western banking and investment, they're drawing attention from the biggest names in global finance. We believe that Islamic finance has the potential to contribute to higher and more inclusive economic growth. According to the Islamic Financial Services Board, the global Islamic financial industry was valued at approximately 1.9 trillion US dollars in 2016. But critics suggest that Islamic financial institutions and their traditional counterparts are not so different. They say that though there is no formal interest, an equivalent comes in a disguised form and much of the infrastructure of Islamic banks closely mimics that of their Western counterparts. With traditional Western financial structures seen as increasingly turbulent, many around the globe are seeking workable alternatives to Western dominance, which could see Islamic finance carve out a larger portion of the global financial market. Pleased to say at the round table we have Mehmed Asute, Professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Political Economy and Finance at Durham University. Also here, Faisal Kabani, the Chief Exec of Insure Halal. He's also the Founder and Chief Exec of Simply Ethical Financial Services Limited. We have Harris Irfan, the author of Heaven's Bankers Inside the Hidden World of Islamic Finance, and Asim Khan, the Chief Exec of Kalish Islami and Islamic Finance Investment and Advisory and between the four of you, I think you can answer all of the questions that I have. Let's go back to that, that point about the borrowing of money. Uh, Harris, let me put this to you. Okay, I go to my conventional bank, $25,000 interest, but I still get the house. They've lent me money and they're making money on it. I go to an Islamic bank, it says, well, I'll tell you what we'll do, because that's wrong. We will buy the house, yeah? You'll have to buy it for $100,000 off us, but we all only get 75,000 back, therefore we make 25,000 in profit. Mm -hmm. That's okay apparently. What's the difference? Well, I think it comes down to the fundamental nature of money. And in theory, Islamic, the Islamic economic model, and I differentiate that from Islamic banking, the model says that the nature of money is different in this model, because money is only meant to be a medium of exchange. That means it measures the value of real goods and services in the economy, rather than being an asset itself to be traded amongst people. So you can't make money out of money, hence you can't lend at interest. But if the Islamic bank says, well, I'll buy this asset, I'll take it on my books, 
and then I'll lease it to you and you can repurchase pieces of the asset over the next, say, 20 years. That's an Islamic bank taking, in theory at least, a real asset risk. But you see, it's still making money out of money. It's not. It's making money out of the asset. And but that's, that's a fundamental. Mystery, isn't it? That's smoke and mirrors. Not really, no, because if we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the financial economy and the real economy, then you wouldn't, for example, have the 2008 financial crisis. If there was a, a fundamental relationship between real goods and services in the economy and what financiers are actually doing to lubricate the movement of those goods and services. It's all very confusing, isn't it? I mean, it is indeed. When you talk to anyone on the street, um, they would respond in the same way that you have identified. What's the difference? I think the major difference, as if one um, um, was identifying, the, the whole idea of what money is and the role of money, the importance of real economy, the sharing economy, the risk sharing part. So quite a number of important distinctions in comparison to uh, conventional economics and finance. Um, however, in the practice, um, because Islamic banks have to work within the existing conventional market economy, and perhaps the issues that we are identifying as the distinguishing nature of Islamic economics and finance has to fit into the existing system and creates the skepticism that you are raising here. Um, otherwise, within a particularly set up, a political economy based on Islamic economics, political economy, the relationship, he, who owns what, what uh, for what, what is the meaning of labor, what is the meaning of capital, what is the meaning of finance, those questions have to be responded. However, currently, in the current systems, in the current hegemony, uh, we have a partial solution, Islam, working within the market economy, and hence the skepticism that we'll, we are We'll raising. talk about the difficulties yes. that, that that raises, but... Please make your point, and then I have a question. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, you were maybe drawing a parallel in terms of Islamic finance being maybe not-for-profit or a bank still making money. I think a clear thing we have to say at the outset is that the Islamic financial system or the Islamic banking industry is not full of people who are running not-for-profit organizations. They're full of commercial organizations. In fact, Islam is very pro-business, pro-enterprise. So in terms of interest being forbidden, and that's a golden rule within Islam, within the Quran, uh, it talks about how money should be used in terms of it should be a means of exchange, a store of value, not a commodity in its own but, right. But haven't clever people just got round the idea that um, interest shouldn't be allowed by making other things available? But that's the point, you know, you take commercial risk in whatever you do, whether you buy an asset or you set up an enterprise. In the example you've given, you basically are buying an asset, a house, and trading it at profit. The bank is acting as a financier in the middle and taking some asset and commercial risk in doing that. Mm. There are issues, undoubtedly, you know, in terms of how much risk is it really taking in reality, etc. And there are many okay. issues to talk I, about. I hear what you say. Mm. I'm still a little bit unsure. But yeah, you two are sure. both involved <coughs> in Islamic finance. I've read a suggestion that this is more about people cloaking themselves in a cultural religious identity than actually getting any practical advice that adheres to their, their philosophy. David, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I think the confusion normally comes in that if you are able to achieve the same objective, either in a conventional, with a conventional instrument or an Islamic instrument, then you say, if I'm able to achieve the same thing, then it probably is the same thing. If you look at uh, Islamic finance, what Islamic finance is trying to do is remove the loan plus interest element. When you go for a conventional banking, what you are doing is you are getting a loan on which you have to pay interest, and from that loan you are buying a property and you're giving a charge on that property. Okay. If something goes wrong, the bank will sell the property, and if there is any difference, the bank will come after you to pay that difference. In the Islamic banking model, if the bank owns the property, the bank gives you the property on rent or you are buying it in pieces, as Harris was saying. So it takes the risk? It, the bank takes the risk. If something goes wrong, the bank is exposed to the market value of the house. But it's probably going to cost me more in the long term. I gave 25000 as an example for both, but it, uh, I think I'm right in saying that it probably costs a little bit more to do it the Islamic way. 
And when we look at the uh, available uh, products in the comparisons, perhaps Islamic financing options are not necessarily the best uh, competitive products available in the market. But there are particular reasons, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, because the structure, the, the, the market system, the way it operates, unfortunately creates additional transaction costs uh, for Islamic financial instruments to be operated in the market. And that may not necessarily enable Islamic finance to offer more competitive. I, I feel better have, about yourself, perhaps. I don't have the same view. I think the reason why it costs more, particularly in the UK, is because Islamic banks are smaller and they're therefore deemed slightly riskier by their banking counterparties and therefore their cost of funds are higher. So their products are more expensive. That isn't the fault of being Islamic, that's the fault of being small. If you look at Islamic banking in places like Malaysia or the Gulf, it's at least as competitive, if not more competitive, as far as the customer is concerned. So I, I don't think the transaction cost is actually a valid reason to say that Islamic banking is more expensive than conventional banking. But I go back to the point that even if it costs you a little bit more, you might feel better about yourself. That's also true, and you made the point about cloaking yourself in any religious identity. I don't think that's the problem. You did allude to earlier saying, isn't it the same thing? Well, actually, we do have some fundamental problems in the Islamic banking industry because there is a lot of, you know, smoke and mirrors. There are a lot of products out there which, frankly, are very dubious, in my view, and probably the, a view shared by many people around this table. There are products that are designed by conventional bankers, and they're cloaked in this you know, religious identity. And actually, I think that my industry, about which I care very deeply, has been hijacked by conventional bankers. You see, one of the things that I've, I've read in backgrounding myself on this is that a, a bank will go to a religious scholar and say, what is the fact? Well, what's, what's the ruling on this? But you might go to three different scholars until you get the answer that you want. Is that no, fair? No, it's not fair. No, that doesn't happen. Mm. Shopping um, around. Well, you say you have unrivaled, this is your website, Cordoba's website, unrivaled access to scholars. Yeah. Um, but presumably you're asking them questions. What actually is happening in the industry is that in certain markets, certain scholars are deemed to be known names, and therefore it is... If you have a, a, a religious certification or a fatwa against a product, more people are likely to accept that product if they know that name who certified it. Mm. If there's a name that's unknown, then people will say, well, who is that? What's their credentials, etc." So actually, there's very little disagreement amongst the scholars on the fundamental issues. But, but, but what, what about this? I'm sorry. Yeah, I no, sure. No, can, can, I, can I come? Absolutely. Either one of you could answer Absolutely. this one. Um, a scholar will say something, yeah, mm. and the bank will ignore it. That happens, doesn't it? Um, I think quite uh, large examples of uh, whether we call it um, Sharia repositioning, whether the Sharia um, or fatwa shopping, but there are certain practices which have been identified um, in academic research as well. Uh, we have seen... As being forbidden? Uh, no, it's not a necessary forbidden, but as a practice. Uh, what, what, um, what we have, quite a number of research identifying that uh, either Sharia scholars have to... Um, fulfill the expected objectives of the banks in, in other order words, to say be able to... Say what the bank wants. Yep, in order to be able to remain in their position um, because there are quite a number of other um, scholars available out there. So, in addition, but we have to perhaps go one step back. We have to identify that there are different schools of thoughts. So there is the initial distinctions uh, we have to inherently within the Islamic uh, schools. So there are those distinctions. But on top of that, the practice that we have around us, uh, Sharia scholars have become not an independent advisor. They are part and parcel of the institutional logic of the bank. So what is the bank's objective is the maximization of profit in the same way in other. Sharia scholars, uh, what is their qualification? What is their standing? I mean, they have a huge responsibility on their shoulders not to uh, give wrong guidance or do something which is truly against the teachings of Islam because they understand that they're only, they, they themselves become sinful but they're effectively misguiding others which they will carry the sin for in the eyes of God. So it's a very, very serious issue. In my 12 years of experience, I've never known a Sharia scholar to knowingly, yeah. uh, you know, compromise his faith. Yeah. Now, I can understand some of the pressures and I take the point about and the they independence. Are paid. They do get paid for exactly. this. Exactly. And this point, point of independence is really important. Uh, that Sharia scholars are well paid often with the banks and therefore are they slightly, you know, uh, sort of pressurised yeah. or, or uh, compromised. You don't think they're ever saying what the bank but wants them to But I think there's say. solutions to this. I mean, around the world, in Malaysia, you have a central Sharia supervisory board, uh, basically through the bank, Nagara, the central bank. 
every product has to be approved through that central supervisory board. Similarly, other jurisdictions are doing the same. So there are solutions yeah. coming into the market to make sure that... And, and that, does that, that doesn't happen here, does it? Uh, that does, I haven't seen, similar to Faisal's experience, I haven't seen scholars, in essence, agreeing all the time with, with the banks. Let me basically first talk about, as Islamic finance has been around for more than 40, 45 years now, the regulatory requirements, the, the Sharia requirements are in the process of being built up. Okay. The powers are being now given to the Sharia scholars to make the final say whether the bank or the institution they are advising should execute that transaction or not. So in Middle East, the general practice is for Islamic banks that they have to take pre-approval uh, from the Sharia board if they are executing a private equity transaction or a real estate transaction. That may not be the case in other jurisdictions. So in other jurisdictions, the scholars may be coming to know about those transactions, which has already happened, and sitting on the books in three to six months. So they are helping the bank resolve a situation. Uh, may I just step in? I mean, um, I fully agree with the process, but when we look at, for instance, the simple example, which we all agree, I guess, the whole idea of the organized tower work is a short-term liquidity uh, for corporate sector. Um, the F International Fuk Academy, which is very respected, is a, a subsidiary of OIC, um, has uh, stated quite some years ago that organized tower work is not lawful, is haram. And, oh, International Fuk Academy is an academy that every one of us in the Muslim world um, have quite respect. But each Islamic bank in the Muslim world, uh, without any shunning away, they do practice organized tawaruk. And that tells us the tension that we have. And recent data shows that in Malaysia, in the last four years, the organized tawaruk has increased by 107%. So that tells us that who is the authority. So because banks forces that, look, this is my objectives, I have to achieve, and therefore, guys, you know, you are Sharia scholars, but you have to facilitate, despite the fact that the central body stated that, no, this is not acceptable. So whether it is in the Gulf or any other countries in Southeast Asia, it's organized tower has become a norm. So norm has been regenerated, unfortunately. Well, well can, can I put something to all of you here? Mm. John Foss, no relation to me, former editor of Islamic Business and Finance Sector, wrote this. It has become a hodgepodge of incoherent, incomplete, impractical and irrelevant ideas. It is a complete muddle, isn't it? Look, I, I think at the end of the day, Islam basically lays down certain principles that Muslims should follow when it comes to their finance and their business. This issue is not going to go away. No. You know, there's been a lot of criticism of the industry. There's been a lot of people pouring cold water over it. But the reality is we have to work to provide real solutions which are authentic according to the Islamic principles. And we have to provide those solutions to 28 or 24 Okay, but if it's the not the way that John Foster describes it, yeah. how is it changing? No, no, I think he has a point in terms of where the industry is today and what, it, what it's put out there in terms of products and services. But the reality is that you can basically structure Sharia compliant, authentic yes. products and you can do this in a proper way. And I think there's a, a vast body of people out there trying to do that. And I think that's David, but they don't have the power. Yeah. No, they don't have the power. No. Yeah. Mm. The conventional banks have the power. Mm. And that's why I think the industry is where it is. Mm. It's failed to achieve its economic ideal yeah. because it's run by the people who have no ideological affinity with that ideal. Yeah. And that's why we are where we are, and that's why John Foster well, well, saying... Why in your book, your, your book title, did you call it Hidden Islamic Finance? Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of obfuscation that goes on in this industry. And I think a lot of bankers and lawyers are sweeping important issues under the carpet. And they're not sharing those issues with the scholars. So I see scholars being blamed a lot yes. in the Without public domain. Without getting too complicated, yeah. tell us what I'll give you an, a good example. Uh, there is a Kuwaiti investment firm called the Investment Dar, TID, who took a, I think it was a $10 million principal investment from Blum Bank, a Lebanese bank. And uh, TID experienced some credit difficulties. They couldn't pay it back. Uh, Blum took them to court. They were English law contracts, so it went to the English courts. And the English judge said, well, I'm not here to judge on Sharia. TID used the argument, this deal wasn't Sharia compliant, and we are a Sharia compliant firm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we will not honor our obligation contractually to pay this back, which, of course, is a legal ruse, because they do have a moral obligation to pay it back. Now, luckily for Blom Bank, the independent Sharia board of TID, the people who were saying, we're not going to pay this back, said, wait a minute. This is Sharia compliant. 
you will pay the money back to Blom Bank, and you will never use Sharia as a defense in a, in a court of law again without consulting us. I think that's a, an excellent example of scholars <coughs> acting in an independent capacity, yeah. even though they're paid by that institution. Let I, me ask you what you think is being done to improve not only um, the mechanics of Islamic banking, but, but the image, because we've heard, and mm. th that's the point of this program, isn't it, to throw up problems sure. to see if they can be solved. We've heard some sure. negative uh, views on what it is. Yep. What, what's being done to solve the practical side and the moral side? Uh, David, first we need to differentiate between where we want to be as, a, as an industry and where we are. Okay. So when we talk about where we want to be, we are looking at all the ideal principles which have been set out in the Sharia, in the Quran, which we want to apply. Where we are at the moment, of course, we are quite far uh, from there. And all these teething issues which are coming up, yeah, they are not abnormal. When you are developing something, when you are trying to do new things, these type of things do come up. We should not be taking it negatively. We should be taking it positively. We should be taking all the critiques. We need to understand uh, what the problems people are facing and how to uh, basically work around it, how to fix those problems. For example, when you look at uh, the contributions of both optimists and pessimists, yes, optimists made airplane and the pessimists made parachute, right? Mm -hmm. Both are basically a positive contribution. So the problem we are in, and I will just want to just comment on what basically uh, Professor Mehmet was saying, is that when we talk about the, the tawarruq or the murabah, I, I take it as a separate issue as compared to doing a non-compliant transaction and realizing later on that it's being compliant. So I'm talking about with regards to the Sharia board that more powers need to be given to the Sharia scholars with regards to the view or what the bank is doing and their timely participation as part of the transaction, basically as Basil Harris was saying, so they know upfront the full information before they approve anything. Now, when it comes to basically the tawarruq or the murabaha, we know that has been a problem. We are looking to, as an industry, looking to develop alternate products. Sharia scholars are approving as an exception because at this point in time, currently, they don't have any alternate option. I yeah. think if I may step down, I think one of the ways of correcting what we have as a practice, unfortunately, the way Islamic finance is practiced is based on entirely on the form. It has been squeezed into certain forms. And fiqh, the Islamic law, is one of those forms. But unfortunately, the way um, fiqh has been developed and practiced in recent years, it misses the moral aspects of the question. And those moral aspects are the issues that we are relating, whether Islamic fi finance is fulfilling everyday people's dream, for instance, overcoming the skepticism that you have raised. Okay. And therefore, that moral uh, has to be part of the equation again. We have to bring that back into the process. We've got to wrap this up in the next few minutes, but yeah. I'd just like to ask this. Mm -hmm. I, I asked two practicing Muslims in, in our office what they thought of it, and they were both unconvinced yeah. at the moment. But it's not just open to Muslims. Yeah, sure. I, I could do it. Absolutely. So good morning, Mr. Bank Manager. <laughs> I'm David Foster. Yes. Uh, why should I want to open an account at your Islamic bank? Okay, because Islamic finance and the principles underpinning it are really about the real economy, about creating real wealth and real prosperity for people. And it's not about dressing something up but in terms of making money upon money or an artificial transaction. So what, it's this, what I wanted to really say to you was that in terms of what we're doing on the ground level and many people are doing, we're saying, look, forget the big institutions and the big banks. If they participate, they don't. Let's do something practical on the ground. So I'll give you two examples. I'm part of an organization, we've launched a fund, which is all about the life science sector and the biotech sector, promoting so positive social impact through equity investment into these ventures. If some of these ventures take off and they get the money, they're going to do real good for the human race. So that's a so real... better that than subprime mortgages. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> or artificial transactions. The other thing about you mentioned, uh, I, I'm a part of Insure Halal. Insure Halal is all about mutual insurance putting money into a pool where we can all benefit from being covered against a particular risk. That money belongs to the members and effectively it's the mutual form of insurance. Again, we've done something practical. We've basically done it in participation of other institutions in the UK. Rather than waiting and being defeatist, I, my call to action to people is to look, do real mm. things, to do positive. Yeah. Yeah, okay, David, I will, I will, I will just add one thing. I'll just add, got two one thing. Yeah. add one thing. Although when we talk about Islamic finance, the rules and the principles have been derived, derived from the faith of Islam, but if you look at it, they are consistent across all the Abrahamic faiths. So the values, the principles, what Islamic finance is trying to promote is consistent with 
Judaism as well as Christianity. So I thought I'll add to that. Yeah. Something very important what Faisal has just said. He's doing things at the grassroots level. So the people in your office who are skeptical, and my family and friends who are skeptical about Islamic finance, actually there's something happening at the grassroots level which is much more important yes. than what's happened in Islamic banking industry. Like so the green far. banking. Yes. Yeah. And, and we've got things happening in the halal economy, not just banking, but the halal yes. economy throughout. Uh, and that is financial technology, for example, where we're cutting out the banks. This is non-bank financing. This is using the Islamic economic model away from the banking industry. Mm. And I think mm. that's the future mm. of Islamic that's finance. For democratization of Islamic finance, as I call it, going to the grassroots, because the banking model is an imposed model. However, uh, what we have traditional ways of doing financing in the Muslim world has been business models. We are forcing these business models into a bank, and bank, by definition, definition is the um, shareholder interest. But the democratization means that it will go to the grassroots. I and sort of that's get an it. important part I sort of, of get it. Story. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, well, that is it, I'm afraid. We have, we have run out of time. I hope you'll forgive the impertinence of some of my questions. But I think I've, I've learned a lot. And in, in deference to Harris's book, which is also called Heaven's Bankers, I think the essence of what I take away from this is that it's a young industry, it's growing, it's changing. I might not make as much money out of it as I would like or if I used conventional banking, but I might feel better about myself and be able to sleep at night. From me, David Foster and the Roundtable team, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time, we hope. Bye-bye for now.